The University of Tennessee Medical Center is our region's only academic medical center. Our mission is to serve through healing, education, and discovery. Our goal is to share the knowledge of our physicians and staff in these health education videos as you make healthcare decisions for yourself and your family. Tobacco, most commonly, along with alcohol, are the two most common carcinogens seen in patients who have experienced a cancer of the mouth or throat. The nicotine content of tobacco is what is primarily responsible for the development of cancer. Since cancer is a genetic disease, meaning that the carcinogens introduce a change in the genetic makeup of the cells in the mouth or the throat. It's believed that tobacco causes a change in the genetic makeup of the tissue. It induces a genetic change and the alcohol is what permits the promotion of that genetic change. Tobacco can be in any form. It can include cigarette smoking or it can include smokeless tobacco. We know that most patients use uh, tobacco in this part of the country who we see, but we know that moderation with regard to tobacco use and alcohol use is very important when discussing mouth and throat cancer. For example, we know that when patients smoke 10 cigarettes or fewer per day and drink alcohol in moderation, that their relative risk of development of mouth and or throat cancer is very similar to patients who don't use tobacco and who don't drink at all. But when patients smoke two packs of cigarettes per day, 40 cigarettes per day, and use moderate or excessive use of alcohol, their relative risk of developing mouth or throat cancer increases to 100, greater than the patient who doesn't use tobacco or alcohol at all. Smokeless tobacco, another form of tobacco that's commonly used by our patients in this region, includes chewing tobacco, moist snuff, and dry snuff. We know that of those three forms of smokeless tobacco, that dry snuff, which typically is used by women in the southeastern United States, is the most carcinogenic. We believe that mild to moderate use of chewing tobacco or moist snuff is associated with a minor risk of the development of oral and throat cancer. But we know that the use of dry snuff has a much higher incidence of the development of these cancers. We also know that the time of the use of dry snuff is very important. For example, for patients who use their dry snuff between 1 and 24 years, their risk of the development of a mouth or throat cancer is about four times that of a patient who doesn't use dry snuff at all. When patients use their dry snuff greater than for 25 years, their risk of the development of cancer of the mouth or throat increases to about 40 times that of a patient who doesn't use this product at all. When patients have a cancer of the mouth or throat, not uncommonly they have no symptoms at all. They don't have pain. They don't know really that anything is going on. Occasionally they may have a sore that doesn't heal. Some of these patients have ear pain. Some patients have difficulty swallowing. Many patients have pain on swallowing. When these cancers become large, it becomes difficult to eat, and so patients start to lose weight. Many of them may experience bleeding, and the most common side uh, effect of these cancers is the development of a painless mass. In asymptomatic patients, it's very valuable for the dentist that the patient visits on a routine basis twice annually to examine high-risk areas of the mouth, particularly in patients who do use tobacco and alcohol. The three high-risk areas where oral cancer likes to occur is the undersurface of the tongue, the area under the tongue we call the floor of mouth, 
and then an area very back in the mouth as it joins the throat, referred to as the retromolar trigone. This is the area where the front of the tonsil meets the back of the tongue and the back edge of the floor of mouth. And this is where we commonly uh, see cancer of the oral cavity. By far, our experience and that of others across the United States is the most common site for cancer to develop in the mouth is tongue. We know that tongue cancer doesn't just occur in elderly people. It doesn't just occur in patients who are smokers and heavy users of alcohol. We have a growing population of patients, particularly male patients, who have never been smokers, who don't use alcohol, but have cancer of the tongue. We've recently identified the presence of a virus in many of these tongue cancers, referred to as human papillomavirus, which has more commonly and historically been associated with the development of cervical cancer in women. We know that since many of our patients also see their primary care doctors uh, at least once annually, that it's important for the primary care doctor to also examine the high-risk sites in the mouth and in the throat as well. Certainly, as with all other cancers, one of the important things for patients to do at home without the consultation of any, any doctor or their dentist is a self-examination. Patients can easily examine the lymph nodes in their neck, go in front of a mirror and displace their tongue, look under their tongue, look in the floor of mouth and the retromolar trigone for the possible existence of ulcers, bumps, or other soft tissue lesions that don't belong there. There are many options available for patients who have cancer of the mouth and throat. Not uncommonly, we recommend surgery to patients. That surgery not only involves the removal of the cancer in the mouth or throat, but also requires the removal of lymph nodes on the same side or both sides of the neck because the lymph nodes in the neck are the first place where the cancers like to spread to. Surgery is oftentimes followed by radiation therapy after the thorough analysis of these soft tissues and bone under the microscope. When these cancers are very large or when removal is not able to be performed because of other medical problems in these patients, and occasionally patients will undergo chemotherapy, sometimes radiation therapy in combination with chemotherapy prior to surgery. And some patients choose not to have surgery uh, at all. We hope you'll join us soon for another medical moment visit utmedicalcenter.org or call the Healthcare Coordination Office at 865-305-6970 to learn about services available at the University of Tennessee Medical Center.